So on to the last topic of this series, which is um, 26.5 line spectra. Basically, um, this is back to the idea that the electrons, uh, if we remember before in our last video we were briefly talking, uh, we have an atom and we have an electron, and the electron will absorb energy from photons of light. Uh, well, remember light being um, electromagnetic radiation of any, so that light could be radio waves or x-rays or anything. So it comes along, gives it all its energy, and uh, one of three things will happen. Either this electron will have enough energy to escape completely, or it will temporarily be excited and be unstable and drop its exc excitation, or it will be excited and remain excited for a little bit, and if it remains excited, it's reached one of these specific energy levels. Okay, so basically what's happened is we can actually analyze these exp uh, levels using things called emission or absorption spectra, and there's a subtle difference between them. Okay, so firstly we have to have a continuous spectrum worked out, and you, uh, that's actually very simple, you've probably all seen this before. Um, you have a light bulb, and you sh uh, white light goes through into a prism, and through the magic of a prism, uh, the light is diffracted into all its wonderful colors, which, like that. And then you have this continuous spectrum showing up, all the colors showing up, and then you can kind of detect that in your detector, and you can be, you know, there's a red, and then there's a green, or yellow, green, blue, all the way through. And um, the lights split up because different wavelengths move differently for a prism, and that's a very complex mechanism, actually. So we won't go into detail about that either. So, um, but then what happens is, if, if you take this white light, which is light of, basically, what if we take light of the entire visible spectrum, and then we go ahead, and we shine it through a gas of hydrogen first. So we have this gas of hydrogen first, and out of the other end will appear to also still be light. But then what if we take a prism, white light still, if we take a prism and it will diffract the light again, and when we absorb it on the other side, we'll see that we'll get the same absorption spectrum, except there's distinct sharp black lines which are dis uh, indicating um, missing things. So that means light of this frequency was completely absorbed by the hydrogen gas. And this is the idea here, that the light of this frequency represents one of these possible energy gaps. Look here, even though there's only seven energy levels displayed in this diagram, there are so many energy gaps, because you can jump from any one energy gap to any other energy gap. So this is all the possibilities displayed. So each one of these lines here represents one of these energy jumps. And basically, um, remembering that basically the only difference between radio waves and visible light and x-rays is the, um, the wavelength and frequency of them. Um, these guys basically went ahead and said, uh, Barmer did a lot of experiments and he found out all the light waves of, say, maybe the visible spectrum. And Lindman did a lot of experiments and he found out all the gaps in the infrared spectrum and they all named them after themselves. So these series, the Lindman Barmer Passion series, um, all they are are series in which all the gaps fall within a certain type of wave, which might be ultraviolet, it might be visible, it might be radio, it might be x-ray, but then they've all gone ahead and named it after themselves, which just makes our life a lot harder. But all we have to know is they're basically categorized all the gaps of a certain type of wave together, but um, all the, that's basically all the gaps that are similar in size. We won't worry about that too much. But then um, there's one more line, uh, 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 spectra we can we can look at. So that was a continuous. Uh, this one here is continuous. This one here is absorption. The last one is emissions. And basically, that what what how that works is that we take a gas and then we give it energy. Um, so this is another way you can excite electrons, and you probably know this one as well, but inadvertently don't realize how it's connected. So we can either say maybe heat it up, or we can give it a, a electrical charge, and that will excite the electrons. And then what happens is this gas has all this energy, and in particular the electrons and the atoms have energy. And then they start emitting the energy as electromagnetic radiation. And then we just put that through, we can just put that straight into a detector. We don't even need to split it as a prism, because it's already split. Well, sometimes we do need to split it as a prism, just to, actually I do take that back. We do need to split it as a prism, just to, um, so our computer can identify it more easily. So um, and then we put that through a prism, and then prism splits it out, and gives us our emission spectrum. And the emission spectrum is all the energy gaps again. And notice that the, the, this is just the backwards in absorption spectrum. All the lines which weren't there before are now there. And that's because of this idea. Before what was happening in the absorption spectrum, was energy was being used to go upwards in these gaps. And um, so maybe it was jumping from here to there, or from here, electron might be from where it was here, it jumped to this state here. And that was called, this jumping was uh, showing that photons were being absorbed and then lost and therefore not, not, not coming through on the other side. 
this is backwards, where we're saying we here are getting electrons to high energy states through other forms, so we're putting electrons up here, and then the electrons will naturally want to go down energy levels, and then they will emit photons of energy offwards, and then, but then the energy gaps, no matter if you're going up or down, are the same because of these discrete energy levels, and that goes to the emission spectrum, and that's hopefully the difference, and hopefully you can understand that, and that's why they fit into each other perfectly. Um, the last thing I need to talk to you about is the idea that, um, uh, that these energy gaps represent certain frequencies of light, and that's because it, it's the gap energy, not the absolute energy. So each of these energy levels have a number, and then maybe you'll get a question of exam that says, um, this gap energy level here is negative 3.6 elec uh, electron volts, and this one here is negative 13.4 electron volts. And it says, um, so electrons were observed to get excited from the center of that state, what frequency of light must have caused this? And then what you do is you take the difference between these two um, energy levels, which we'd know is 9.8 electron volts, and then you can say um, uh, energy equals HF, and then it's really simple. Energy is 9.8, we know what H is, so we just go 9.8 electron volts divided by H, and we have our frequency of light. That's all it is. And you have to look at that. It's, so um, every single one of these gaps of any kind represent a certain frequency of light and it's the difference between this energy level and this energy level it's not the actual this total energy level it's the difference in energy levels and we have to realize the top energy level is zero because that's when the electron is away completely from the atom and um, it requires no energy to escape the energy levels are actually the energy it requires to escape the atom completely. So at this ne for negative 13.4 electron volts, if you gave the atom 13.4 electron volts, the atom would uh, sorry the electron the electron would be able to escape the atom completely. Um, so that's all it is. And um, so as you can see, it's relatively simple. And uh, you can see if we excite this, it will ex emit a whole range of spectrums, as we can see from all the series here. And this is just elect uh, hydrogen. All elements do this, and you can um, use this to emit X-rays or gamma rays or lasers or microwaves or radio waves or anything, just by um, this very simple mechanism. So that's all it really is. And then um, one last thing I'd like to point out for you is a formula that might be useful, um, hopefully to you at some point in time. Um, here's a formula here. So we know that um, uh, HF equals um, E2 minus E1, which is basically the change in energy level. Or E1 minus E2, no matter, depending on how you want to look at it. So we know that, but um, this is also HF is also known as a change in energy. So we can look at that. So we, let's let's write rewrite it as that HF equals a change in energy level. And what do we know F is? F um, uh, frequency times wavelength equals speed of light. So F equals uh, the speed of light over wavelength. So what if we replace it, rewrite it like that? And um, HC over wavelength equals a change in energy. And then we can rearrange this and we can look at, say, the, uh, the wavelength of light which causes a change in energy is always equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light um, divided by the change in energy. And this is just a kind of rewritten of the same formula that you might find useful to know. And um, whenever an electron moves, it's always called an electron transition. So that's just some more terminology. And know the difference between absorption, which is going up in energy levels, and emission, which is going down from energy levels. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, my videos, and um, please subscribe and visit my blog, especially if you want to see more. Um, it will be very encouraging, and um, see you later.